The body and the earth, on the cliff, the question of human, the question of human limits of the proper definition and place of human beings within the order of creation finally rests upon our attitude toward our biological existence, the life of the body in this world. What value and respect do we give to our bodies? What uses do we have for them? What relation do we see, if any, between body and mind, or body and soul? What connections or responsibilities do we maintain between our bodies and the earth? These are religious questions, obviously, for our bodies are part of the creation, and they involve us in all the issues of mystery. But the questions are also agricultural, for no matter how urban our life, our bodies live by farming. We come from the earth and return to it, and so we live in agriculture as we live in flesh. While we live, our bodies are moving particles of the earth, joined inextricably both to the soil and to the bodies of other living creatures. It is hardly surprising, then, that there should be some profound resemblances between our treatment of our bodies and our treatment of the earth. That humans are small within the creation is an ancient perception, represented often enough in art that it must be supposed to have an elemental importance. On one of the painted walls of the Lascaux Cave, 20,000 to 15,000 BC, surrounded by the exquisitely shaped, shaded, and colored bodies of animals, there is the childish stick figure of a man, a huntsman, who, having cast his spear into the guts of a bison, is now weaponless and vulnerable, poignantly frail, exposed, and incomplete. The message seems essentially that of the voice out of the whirlwind in the book of Job, the creation is bounteous and mysterious, and humanity is only a part of it, not its equal, much less its master. Old Chinese landscape paintings reveal, among towering mountains, the frail outline of a roof or a tiny human figure passing along a road on foot or horseback. These landscapes are almost always populated. There is no implication of a dehumanized interest in nature for its own sake. For its own sake, quote unquote. What is represented is a world in which humans belong but which does not belong to humans in any tidy economic sense. The creation provides a place for humans, but it is greater than humanity, and within it, even great men are small. Such humility is the consequence of an accurate insight, ecological in its bearing, not a pious deference to, quote-unquote, spiritual value. Closer to us is a passage from the fourth act of King Lear, describing the outlook from one of the Dover cliffs. The crows and chows that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire, dreadful trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice, and yond tall anchoring bark diminished to her something. There's something, a buoy, almost too small for sight. And this is no more, no mere description of a scenic view, quote unquote view. It is part of a play within a play, a sort of ritual of healing. In it, Shakespeare is concerned with the, cur the curative power of the perception we are dealing with. By understanding accurately his proper place in creation, a man may be made whole. In the lines quoted, 
Edgar, disguised as a lunatic, a bedlamite, is speaking to his father, the Earl of Gloucester, Gloucester, Gloucester. Gloucester, having been blinded by the treachery of his false son, Edmund, has despaired and has asked the supposed madman to lead him to the cliff's edge, where he intends to destroy himself. But, Edgar, but Edgar's description is from memory. The two are not standing on any such dizzy verge. What we are witnessing is the working out of Edgar's strategy to save his father from false feeling, both the pride, the smug credulity that led to his suffering and the, dis and the despair that is its result. These emotions are perceived as madness. Gloucester's Gloucester, okay, we'll say Glau Gloucester's blindness is literally the result of the moral blindness of his pride, and it is symbolic of the spiritual blindness of his despair. Thinking himself on the edge of a cliff, he renounces this world and throws himself down. Though he falls only to the level of his own feet, he is momentarily stunned. Edgar remains with him, but now represents himself as an innocent bystander at the foot of what Glau Gloucester will continue to think is a tall cliff. As the man recovers his senses, Edgar persuades him that the madman who led him to the cliff's edge was in reality a fiend, and Gloucester rep repents his self-destructiveness, which he now recognizes as another kind of pride. A human has no right to destroy what he did not create. You ever gentle gods, take my breath from me. Let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. What Gloucester has passed through then is a rite of death and rebirth. In his new awakening, he is finally able to recognize his true son, he escapes the unhuman conditions of godly pride and fiendish despair and dies smilingly in the truly human estate, twixt two extremes of passion, joy and grief. Until modern times, we focused a great deal of the best of our thought upon such rituals of return to the human condition. Seeking enlightenment or the promised land or the way home, a man would go or be forced to go into the wilderness, measure himself against the creation, recognize finally his true place within it, and thus be saved both from pride and from despair. Seeing himself as a tiny member of a world he cannot comprehend or master in any final sense possess, or in any final sense possess, he cannot possibly think of himself as a god. And by the same token, since he shares in, depends upon, and is graced by all of which he is a part, neither can become, neither can be become a fiend. Neither can he become a fiend. Okay. What's going on? Neither can he become a fiend. He cannot descend into the final despair of destructiveness. Returning from the wilderness, he becomes a restorer of order, a preserver. He sees the truth, recognizes his true heir, honors his forebears and his heritage, and gives his blessing to his successors. He embodies the passing of human time, living and dying within the human limits of grief and joy. On the Tower Apparently, with the rise of industry, we began to romanticize the wilderness, which is to say we began to institutionalize it within the concept of the quote-unquote scenic. Because of railroads and improved high highways, the wilderness was no longer an arduous passage for the traveler, but something to be looked at as, a, as grand or beautiful from the high vantages of the roadside. We became viewers of quote-unquote views. And because we no longer traveled in the wilderness as a matter of course, we forgot that wilderness still circumscribed civilization and persisted in domesticity. We forgot, indeed, that the civilized and the domestic continued to depend upon wilderness. 
that is, upon natural forces within the climate and within the soil that have never in any meaningful sense been controlled or conquered. Modern civilization has been built largely in this forgetfulness. And as we transformed the wilderness into scenery, we began to feel in the presence of quote unquote nature and all that was increasingly statistical, we would not become appreciators of the creation until we had taken its measure. Once we had climbed or driven to the mountaintop, we were awed by the view, but, but it was an awe that we felt compelled to validate or prove by the knowledge of how high we stood and how far we saw. We are invited to, quote, see seven states from atop Lookout Mountain, unquote, as if our political boundaries had been drawn in red on the third morning of creation. Uh, we became less and less capable of sensing ourselves as small within creation, partly because we thought we could comprehend it statistically, but also because we were becoming creators ourselves of a mechanical creation by which we felt ourselves greatly magnified. We built bridges that stood impossibly in titanic settings, towers that stood around us like geologic presences, single machines that could do the work of hundreds of people. Why, after all, should one get excited about a mountain when one can see almost as far from the top of a building, much farther from an airplane, farther still from a space capsule, we have learned to be fascinated by the statistics of mag magnitude and power. There is apparently no limit in sight, no end, and so it is no wonder that our minds, dizzy with numbers, take refuge in a yearning for infinitudes of energy and materials. And yet these works so magnify us, yet these works that so magnify us also dwarf us, reduce us to insignificance. They magnify us because we are capable of them. They diminish us because, say what we will, once we build beyond a human scale, once we conceive ourselves as titans or as gods, we are lost in magnitude. We cannot control or limit what we do. The statistics of magnitude call out like sirens to the statistics of destruction. If we have built towering cities, we have raised even higher the cloud of mega death. If people are as grass before God, they are as nothing before their machines. If we are fascinated by the statistics of magnitude, we are no less fascinated by the statistics of our insignificance. We never tire of repeating the commonizing figures of population and population growth. We are entranced to think of ourselves as specks on the pages of our own overwhelming history. I remember that my high school biology text dealt with the human body by listing its constituent elements, measuring their quantities and giving their monetary worth at, their time, at that time a little less than a dollar. That was a bit of the typical fodder of the modern mind, that once sensational and belittling. No accidental product of the age of Dachau and Hiroshima. Can I pronounce that one? In our time, Shakespeare's cliff has become the tower of a bridge, not the scene of awakening rite of symbolic death and rebirth, but of the real and final death of suicide. Hart Crane wrote its paradigm as if against its will, as if against his will, in the bridge. Out of some subway scuttle, cell or loft, a bedlamite speeds to thy parapets tilting there moment momentarily, shrill shirt ballooning. A jest falls from the speechless caravan. In Shakespeare, the real bedlamite or madman is the desperate and suicidal Gloucester. The supposed bedlamite is in reality his true son. And together they enact an eloquent ritual in which Edgar gives his father a vision of creation. Gloucester abandons, health, uh, abandons himself to this vision, literally casting himself into it and is renewed. He finds his life by losing it. Gloucester is saved by a renewal of his sense of the world and of his proper place in it. And this is brought about by an enactment that is communal, 
both in the sense that he is in a com- that he is accompanied in it by his son, who for the time being has assumed the disguise of a madman, but the role of a priest, and in the sense that it is deeply traditional in its symbols and meanings. In Crane, on the other hand, the Bedlamite is alone, surrounded by speechlessness, cut off within the crowd from any saving or renewing vision. The height, which in Shakespeare is the traditional place of vision, has become an, in Crane a place of blindness. The bridge, which Crane intended as a unifying symbol, has become the, sim- the symbol of a final estrangement. Health. After I had begun to think about these things, I received a letter containing an account of a more recent suicide. The following sentences from that letter seemed both to corroborate Crane's lines and to clarify them. My friend jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge two months ago. She had been terribly depressed for years. There was no help for her, none that she could, none that she could find that was sufficient. She was trying to get from one phase of her life to another and couldn't make it. She had been terribly wounded as a child. Her wound could not be healed. She destroyed herself. The letter had already asked, how does a human pass through youth to maturity without, quote, breaking down? And it had answered, help from tradition through ceremonies and rituals, rites of passage at the most difficult stages. My correspondent went on to say, healing, it seems to me, is a necessary and useful word when we talk about agriculture. And a few paragraphs later, he wrote, the theme of suicide belongs in a book about agriculture. I agree, but I am also aware that many people will find it exceedingly strange that these themes should enter so forcibly into this book. It will be thought that I am off the subject. And so I want to take pains to show that I am on the subject and on it, moreover, in the only way most people have of getting on it, by way of the issue of their own health. Indeed, it is when one approaches agriculture from any other issue than that of health that one may be said to be off the subject. The difficulty probably lies in our narrowed understanding of the word health, that there is some connection between how we feel and what we eat between our bodies and the earth, is acknowledged when we say that we must, quote, eat right to keep fit, unquote, or that we should, quote, eat a balanced diet, unquote. But by health, we mean little more than how we feel. We are healthy, we think, if we do not feel any pain or too much pain. And if we are strong enough to do our work, if we become unhealthy, we go, then we go to a doctor who we hope will cure us and restore us to health. By health, in other words, we mean merely the absence of disease. Our health professionals are interested almost in, exclusively in preventing disease, mainly by destroying germs, and in curing disease, mainly by surgery and destroying germs. But the concept of health is rooted in the concept of wholeness. To be healthy is to be whole. The word health belongs to a family of words, a listing of which we will suggest how far the consideration of health of health must carry us. Heal, whole, wholesome, hail, hallow, holy. And so it is possible to give a definition to health that is positive and far more elaborate than that given it to it than, than that given to it by most medical doctors and the officers of public health. If the body is healthy, then it is whole. But how can it be whole and yet be dependent, as it obviously is, upon other bodies and upon the earth, upon all the rest of creation, in fact? It becomes clear that the health or wholeness of the body is a vast subject, and that to preserve it calls for a vast enterprise. Blake said that man has no body distinct from his soul and thus acknowledge the convergence of health and holiness. In that, in that, all the convergences and dependencies of creation are surely implied. Our bodies are also not distinct from the bodies of other people, 
on which they depend in a complexity of ways from biological to spiritual. They are not distinct from the bodies of plants and animals from which we are involved in the cycles of feeding and in the intricate companionships of ecological systems and of the spirit. They are not distinct from the earth, the sun and moon, and the other heavenly bodies. It is therefore absurd to approach the subject of health piecemeal, the subject of health piecemeal with a departmentalized band of specialist, specialists. A medical doctor uninterested in nutrition and agriculture and the wholesomeness of mind and spirit is as absurd as a farmer who is uninterested in health. Our fragmentation of this subject cannot be our cure because it is our disease. The body cannot be whole alone. Persons cannot be whole alone. It is wrong to think that bodily health is compatible with spiritual confusion or cultural disorder or with polluted air and water and impoverished soil. Intellectually, we know that these patterns of interdependence exist. We understand them better now, perhaps, than we ever have before. Yet modern social and cultural patterns contradict them and make it difficult or impossible to honor them in practice. To try to heal the body alone is to collaborate in the destruction of the body. Healing is impossible in loneliness. It is the opposite of loneliness. Conviviality is healing. To be healed, we must come with all the other creatures to the feast of creation. Together, the above two descriptions of suicides suggest this very powerfully. The setting of both is urban amid the gigantic works of modern humanity. The fatal sickness is despair, a wound that cannot be healed because it is encapsulated in loneliness, surrounded by speechlessness. Past the scale of the human, our works do not liberate us, they confine us. They cut off access to the wilderness of creation where we must go to be reborn, to receive the awareness at once humbling and exhilarating, grievous and joyful, that we are a part of creation, one with all that, with all that we live from and all that in turn lives from us. They destroy the communal rites of passage that turn us toward the wilderness and bring us home again. The isolation of the body. Perhaps the fundamental damage of the specialist system, the damage from which all other damages issue, has been the isolation of the body. At some point, we began to assume that the life of the body would be the business of grocers and medical doctors who need take no interest in the spirit, whereas the life of the spirit would be the business of churches, which would have at best only a negative interest in the body. In the same way, we began to see nothing wrong with putting the body, most often somebody else's body, but frequently our own, to a task that insulted the mind and demeaned the spirit. And we, and we began to find it easier than ever to prefer our own bodies in the body to the bodies of other creatures and to abuse, exploit, and otherwise hold in contempt the, those other bodies for the greater good or comfort of our own. The isolation of the body sets it into direct conflict with everything else in creation. It gives it a value that is destructive of every other value. That this has happened is paradoxical, for the body was set apart from the soul in order that the soul should triumph over the body. This, the aim is stated in Shakespeare's sonnet 146-146 as plainly as anywhere. Poor soul, the center of my sinful earth, lord of these rebel powers that thee array, why dost thou pine within and suffer dearth, painting thy outward walls so costly gay? Why so large cost, having so short a lease? Dost thou upon thy fading mansion spend? Shall worms, inheritors of this excess, eat up thy charge? Is this my body's end? Then, soul, live thou upon thy servant's loss, and let that pine to aggravate thy store. By terms divine, in selling hours of dross, within be fed, without be rich no more. So shalt thou feed on death that feeds on men. And death once dead, there's no more dying then. 
The soul is thus set against the body to thrive at the body's expense. And so a spiritual economy is devised within which the only law is competition. If the soul is to live in this world only by denying the body, then its relation to worldly life becomes extremely simple and superficial. Too simple and superficial, in fact, to cope in any meaningful or useful way with the world. Spiritual value ceases to have any worldly purpose or force. To fail to employ the body in this world at once for its own good and the good of the soul is to issue an invitation to disorder of the most serious kind. What was not foreseen in this simple-minded economics of religion was that it is not possible to devalue the body and value the soul. The body, cast loose from the soul, is on its own. Devalued and cast out of the temple, the body does not skulk off like a sick dog to die in the bushes. It sets up a counterpart economy of its own, based also on the law of competition, in which it devalues and exploits the spirit. These two economies maintain themselves at each other's expense, living, living upon each other's loss, collaborating without cease in mutual futility and absurdity. You cannot devalue the body and value the soul, or value anything else. The prototypical act issuing from this division was to make a person a slave and then instruct him in religion, a, quote, charity, more damaging to the master than to the slave. Contempt for the body is invariably manifested in contempt for, e for other bodies, the bodies of slaves, laborers, women, animals, plants, the earth itself. Relationships with all other creatures become competitive and exploitive, exploitive rather than collaborative and convivial. The world is seen and dealt with not as an ecological community, but as a stock exchange, the ethics of which are based on the tragically misnamed law of the jungle. This jungle law is a basic fallacy of modern culture. The body is degraded and saddened by being set in conflict against the creation itself, of which all bodies are members, therefore members of each other. The body is thus sent to war against itself. Divided, set against each other, body and soul drive each other to extremes of misapprehension and folly. Nothing could be more absurd than to despise the body and yet yearn for its resurrection. In reaction to this supposedly religious attitude, we get not reverence or respect for the body, but another kind of contempt, the desire to comfort and indulge the body with equal disregard for its health. The, the, the quote, dialogue of body and soul, unquote, in our time is being carried on between those who despise the body for the sake of its resurrection and those diseased by bodily extravagance and lack of exercise who nevertheless desire longevity above all things. The, these think that they oppose each other, and yet they could not exist apart. They are locked in a conflict that is really then, that is really their collaboration in the destruction of soul and body both. What this conflict has done, among other things, is to make it extremely difficult to set a proper value on the life of the body in this world, to believe that it is good, howbeit short and imperfect. Until we are able to say this and know what we mean by it, we will not be able to live our lives in the human estate of grief and joy, but repeatedly will be cast outside in violent swings between pride and despair. Desires that cannot be fulfilled in health will keep us hopelessly restless and unsatisfied. Competition. By dividing body and soul, we divide both from all else. We thus, we thus condemn ourselves to a loneliness for which the only compensation is violence against other creatures, against the earth, against ourselves. For no matter the distinctions we draw between body and soul, body and earth, ourselves and others, the connections, the dependences, and the identities remain. And so we fail to contain or control our violence. It gets loose. Though there are categories of violence, or so we think, there are no categories of victims. Violence against one is ultimately violence against all. 
The willingness to abuse other bodies is the willingness to abuse one's own. To damage the earth is to damage your children. To despise the ground is to despise its fruit. To despise the fruit is to despise its eaters. The wholeness of health is broken by despite. If competition is the correct relation of creatures to one another and to the earth, then we must ask why exploitation is not more successful than it is. Why, having lived so long at the expense of other creatures and the earth, are we not healthier and happier than we are? Why does modern society exist under constant threat of the same suffering, deprivation, spite, contempt, and obliteration that it has imposed on other people and other creatures? Why do the health of the body and the health, the health of the earth decline together? And why, in consideration of this decline of our worldly flesh and household, our sinful earth, are we not healthier in spirit? It is not necessary to have recourse to, stati to statistics. To st it is not necessary to have recourse to statistics to see that the that the human estate is declining with the estate of nature, and that the corruption of the body is the corruption of the soul. I know that the country is full of quote unquote leaders and experts of various sorts who are using statistics to prove the opposite that we have more cars, more superhighways, more TV sets, motorboats, prepared motorboats, prepared foods, etc., than any people ever had before, and are therefore better off than any people ever were before. I can see the burgeoning of this quote-unquote consumer economy and can appreciate some of its attractions and comforts, but that economy has an inside and an outside. From the outside, there are other things to be seen. I am writing this in the north central part of Kentucky on a morning near the end of June. We have had rain for two days, hard rain during the last several hours. From where I can from where I sit, I can I can see the Kentucky River swiftening, <laughs> swiftening, and rising, the water already yellow with mud. I know that inside the city-oriented consumer economy, there are many people who will never see this muddy rise and many who will see it without knowing what it means. I, I know also that there are many who will see it and know what it means and not care. If it lasts until the weekend, there will be people who will find it as good as clear water for, mo for motorboating and water skiing. In the past several days, I have seen some of the worst eroded cornfields that, that I have seen in this country in my life. This erosion is occurring on the, the cash-rented farms of farmers, widows, and city farmers, absentee owners, the doctors and businessmen who buy a farm for the tax breaks or to have a quiet place in the country for the weekends. It is the direct result of economic and agricultural policy it might be said to be an economic and agricultural policy. The signs of the quote unquote agri-dollar, big business fantasy of the butts mentality are all present. The absenteeism, the temporary and shallow interests of the land renter, the row cropping of slopes, the lack of rotation, the plowed out, rock, plowed out waterways, the rows running up and down the hills, Looked at, looked at from the field's edge. This is ruin, criminal folly, moral idiocy. Looked at from Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., from inside the quote-unquote economy. It is called free enterprise and full production. And around me here, as everywhere else I have been in this country, in Nebraska, Iowa, Indiana, New York, New England, Tennessee, the farmland is in general decline. Fields and whole farms abandoned, given up with their scars unmended, washing away under the weeds and bushes, fine land put to rap, put to row crops year after year, without rest or rotation. Buildings and fences going down, good houses standing empty, unpainted, their windows broken. And it is clear to anyone who looks carefully at any crowd that we are wasting our bodies exactly as we are wasting our land. Our bodies are fat, weak, joyless, sickly, ugly, the virtual 
prey of the manufacturers of medicine and cosmetics. Our bodies have become marginal. They are growing useless, like our marginal land, quote-unquote, marginal land, because we have less and less use for them. After the games and idle flourishes of modern youth, we use them only as shipping cartons to transport our brains and our few employable muscles back and forth to work. As for our spirits, they seem more and more to comfort themselves by buying things, no longer in need of the exalted drama of grief and joy. They feed now on little shocks of greed, scandal, and violence. For many of the churchly, the life of the spirit is reduced to a dull preoccupation preoccupation with getting to heaven. At best, the world is no more than an embarrassment and a trial to the spirit, which is otherwise radically separated from it. The true lover of God must not be burdened with any care or respect for his works. While the body goes about its business of destroying the earth, the soul is supposed to lie back and wait for Sunday, keeping itself free of earthly contaminants. While the body exploits other bodies, the soul stands aloof, free from sin, crying to the gawking bystanders, I am not enjoying it. As far as the sort of religion is concerned, the body is no more than the lusterless container of the soul, a mere package that will nevertheless light up in, light up in eternity, forever cool and shiny as a neon cross. Shiny as a neon cross. This separation of the soul from the body and from the world is no disease of the fringe, no aberration, but a fracture that runs through the mentality of institutional religion like a geologic fault. And, and this rift in the mentality of religion continues to characterize the modern mind, no matter how secular or worldly it becomes. But I have not stated my point exactly enough. This rift is not like a geologic fault. It is a geologic fault. It is a flaw in the mind that runs inevitably into the earth. Thought affects or afflicts substance neither by intention nor by accident, but because according it occurring in the creation that is unified and whole, it must, there is no help for it. There is no help for it. The soul in its loneliness hopes only for salvation. And yet, what is the burden of the Bible if not a sense of the mutuality of influence rising out of an essential unity among soul and body and community and world? These are all the works of God, and it is therefore the work of virtue to make or restore harmony among them. The world is certainly thought of as a place of spiritual trial, but it is, but it is also the confluence of soul and body, word and flesh, where thoughts must become deeds, where goodness is to be enacted. This is the great meeting place, the narrow passage where spirit and flesh, word and world, pass into each other. The Bible's aim, as I read it, is not the freeing of the spirit from the world. It is the handbook of their interaction. It says that they cannot be divided, that their mutuality, their unity, is inescapable, that they are not reconciled in division, but in harmony. What else can be meant by the resurrection of the body? The body should be, quote, filled with light, perfected in understanding. And so everywhere there is the sense of consequence, fear and desire, grief and joy. What is desirable is repeatedly defined in the tensions of the sense of consequence. False prophets are to be known, quote, by their fruits. We are to treat others as we would be treated. Thought is thus barred from any easy escape into aspiration or ideal. is is turn around turned around and forced into action the following verses from proverbs are not very likely the original work of a philosopher king they are overheard from generations of agrarian grandparents whose experience taught them that spiritual qualities become earthly events I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding, and lo, 
it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Connections. I do not want to speak of unity misleadingly or too simply. Obvious distinctions can be made between body and soul, one body and other bodies, body and world, etc. But these things that appear to be distinct are nevertheless caught in a network of mutual dependence and influence that is the substantiation of their unity, body, soul, or, or mind or spirit, community, and world are all susceptible to each other's influence, and they are all conductors of each other's body, soul, community, and world are all susceptible to each other's influence, and they are all conductors of each other's influence. The body is damaged by the, be by the bewilderment of the spirit, and it conducts the influence of that bewilderment into the earth. The earth conducts it into the community, and so on. If a farmer fails to understand what health is, his farm because becomes unhealthy. It produces unhealthy food, which damages the health of the community. But this is a network a spherical network by which each part is connected to every other part. The farmer is a part of the community, and so it is as impossible to say exactly where the trouble began as to say where it will end. The influences go backward and forward, up and down, round and round, compounding and branching as they go. All that is certain is that an error introduced anywhere in the network ramifies beyond the scope of prediction. Consequences occur all over the place, and each consequence breeds further consequences. But it seems unlikely that an error can ramify endlessly. It spreads by way of the connections in the network, but sooner or later, but it, sooner or later, it must also begin to break them. We are talking, obviously, about a circulatory system, and a disease of a circulatory system tends first to impair circulation and then to stop it altogether. Healing, on the other hand complicates the system by opening and restoring connections among the various parts. In this way, restoring the ultimate simplicity of their union. When all the parts of the body are working together, are under each other's influence, we say that it is whole, it is healthy. The same is true of the world, of which our bodies are parts. The parts are healthy insofar as they are joined harmoniously to the whole. What the specialization of our age suggests, in one example after another, is not only that fragmentation is a disease, but that the diseases of the disconnected parts are similar or analogous to one another. Thus, they memorialize their lost unity, their relation persisting in their, con in their disconnection. Any severance produces two wounds that are, among other things, the record of how the severed parts once fitted together. The so-called identity crisis, for instance, is a disease that seems to have become prevalent after the disconnection of body and soul and the other peace mealings of the modern period. One's, quote, identity is apparently the immaterial part of one's being, also known as psyche, soul, spirit, self, mind, etc. The dividing of this principle from the body and from any particular worldly locality would seem reason enough for a crisis. Treatment, it might be thought, would logically consist in the restoration of these connections. The lost identity would find itself by recognizing physical landmarks, by connecting itself reciprocally to practical circumstance, circumstances. It would learn to stay put in the body to which it belongs and in the place to which preference or history or accident has brought it. It would, in short, find itself in finding its work. But, quote, finding yourself the pseudo-ritual by which the identity crisis is supposed to be resolved, makes use of no such immediate references. Leaving aside the obvious and ancient realities of doubt and self-doubt, as well as the authentic madness that is often the result of cultural disintegration, it seems likely that the identity crisis is a conventional illusion, one of the genres of, of self-indulgence. It can be an excuse for irresponsibility or a fashionable mode of self-dramatization. It is the easiest form of self-flattery, a way to continue procrastination as a virtue, based on the romantic assumption that, quote, who I really am, is better in some fundamental way than the available evidence would suggest.
The fashionable cure for this condition, if I understand the lore of it correctly, has nothing to do with the assumption of responsibilities or the renewal of connections. The cure is, quote, autonomy, another illusory condition, suggesting that the self can be self-determining and independent without regard for any determining circumstance or any of the obvious dependences. This seems little more than a jargon term for indifference to the opinions and feelings of other people. There is, in practice, no such thing as autonomy. Practically, there is only a distinction between responsible and irresponsible dependence. It inevitably failing this impossible standard of autonomy, the modern self-seeker becomes a tourist of cures, submitting his quest to the guidance of one guru after another. The cure thus preserves the disease. It is not surprising that this strange disease of the spirit, the self's loss of self, should have its have its counterpart in an anguish of the body. One of the commonplaces of modern experience is dissatisfaction with the body, not as one has allowed it to become, but as it naturally is. The hardship is perhaps greater here, because the body, unlike the self, is, is substantial and cannot be supposed to be inherently better than it was born to be. It can only be thought inherently worse than it ought to be. For the appropriate standard for the body, that is, health, has been replaced, not even by another standard, but by very exclusive physical models. The concept of, quote, model here conforms very closely to the model of the scientists and planners. It is an exclusive, narrowly defined ideal that affects destructively whatever it does not in include. Thus, our young people are offered the ideal of health only by what they know to be lip service. What they are made to feel forcibly and to measure their, themselves by is the exclusive desirability of a certain physical model. Girls are taught to want to be leggy, slender, large-breasted, curly-haired, unimposingly beautiful. Boys are instructed to be, quote, athletic in build, tall, but not too tall broad-shouldered, deep-chested, narrow-hipped, square-jawed, straight-nosed, not bald, unimposingly handsome. Both sexes should look what passes for, quote, sexy in a bathing suit. Neither, above all, should look old. Though many people in health are beautiful, very few resemble those models. The result is widespread suffering that does immeasurable damage both to individual persons and to the society as a whole. The result is another absurd pseudo-ritual, quote, accepting one's body, which may take years or be the distraction of a lifetime. Woe to the man who is short or skinny or bald. Woe to the man with a big nose. Woe above all to the woman with small breasts or a muscular body or strong features. Homer and Solomon might have thought her beautiful, but she will see her own beauty only by a difficult rebellion. And like the crisis of identity, this crisis of the body brings a helpless dependence on cures. Cure, one spends one life, one spends one's life dressing and making up to compensate for one's supposed deficiencies. Again, the cure preserves the disease and the putative healer is the guru of style and beauty aid. The sufferer is by definition a customer. Sexual division. To divide body and soul or body and mind is to inaugurate an expanding series of divisions, not however an infinitely expanding series because it is apparently the nature of division sooner or later to destroy what, it, what is divided. The principle of durability is unity. The divisions issuing from the division of body and soul are first sexual and then ecological. Many other divisions branch out from those, but those are the most important because they have to do with the fundamental relationships with each other and with the earth uh, that we all have in common. To think of the body as separate from the soul or as soulless, either to subvert its appetites or to quote, free them, is to make an object of it. As a thing, the body is denied any dimension or rightful pleasant presence or claim in the mind. I'm reading. Oh, geez. 
I mean, yeah, I'm recording a video, but I want to see the video. Maybe the text. Maybe the video. To think of the body as separate from the soul or as soulless, either to subvert its appetites or to, quote, free them, is to make an object of it. As a thing, the body is denied any dimension or rightful presence or claim in the mind. The concerns of the body, all that is comprehended in the term nurture, are thus degraded, denied any respected place among the higher things, the, quote, higher things, and even among the more exigent practicalities. The first sexual division comes about when nurture is made the exclusive concern of women. This cannot happen until a society becomes industrial. In hunting and gathering and in agricultural societies, men are of necessity also involved in nurture. In those societies, there have usually been ha there usually have been differences between the work of men and that of women. But the necessity here is to distinguish between sexual difference and sexual division. In an industrial society, society, following the division of body and soul, we have at the, quote, upper or professional level, a division between, quote, culture in the specialized sense of religion, philosophy, art, the humanities, etc., and, quote, practicality. And both of these become increasingly abstract. Thinkers do not act. And the, practic the, quote, practical men do not work with their hands, but manipulate the abstract quantities and values that come from the work of, quote, workers. Workers are simplified or specialized into machine parts to do the wage work of the body, which they were initially permitted to think of as, quote, manly, because for the most part, women did not do it. Women traditionally have per performed the most confining dash, though not. All right, that's it. We're done.